Oh, my rapid ass. Cute. Love Cute. Kiss it. Smart. Sometimes on the lips. When no it's one's amazing, looking. Sometimes don't you I reach think? down. Of and course you do. Oh, my kids. Its legs are oh, made yes. for running, but Stunning. the definition in the Kindly. muscles. It How just you makes you it? think. Don't you want to see me? So rapid dash to our secret spot. Spectacular. all that really happens to me. I'm a fire top guy, but my main problem with Rapidash that I've had since I pretty much started playing Pokemon is that its design is just kind of mid, and the times that you encounter it in the playthroughs, it's forgettable. Counting the evolutionary lines as one, there are only seven fire top choices in Kanto, and I think I would choose all of them over the Ponyta line, and I have. But this series is all about keeping an open mind and objectively seeing how a Pokemon can perform in solo runs, so let's kind of leave our bias at the door, grab a Sodi Pop, and let's just dive into it. I'm going to start the video with some negatives we're gonna get them out of the way real quick the overarching dread that this run and all fire type pokemon face is that inevitable march towards lance's gyarados and it really changes how you would route the run compared to something that can just deal with it when you optimize runs like this gyarados is going to be a focal point that most of the runs are going to have to build towards and as a result fire type pokemon are just at an inherent disadvantage over other things now let's bring up that learn set and just to be positive for a second ember and stomp get Getting them at level 1, it forms a pretty solid core of starting moves, it feels pretty great, but my personal gripes come from the rest of the learn set, there's just, there's nothing here. In my opinion, agility is by far the worst badge boosting move in the game, and even if you like it, even if you want to use it, you don't get it until really late, and then they just throw Rapidash into that same Moltres box, they shove it into the corner, Game Freak said, no flamethrower for you as if fire types didn't have it bad enough already. Looking at the TMs here, you can see why an alternate title for this video would be neutral damage the solo run, because there's just not much here. Body slam's great, we know that, don't need to talk about it. And then fire blast is a pretty nice runner up, does a lot of damage since we don't get flamethrower, but unless Pokemon in the late game battles all magically just turn into grass, bug, or pure ice types, Rapidash is just gonna be doing neutral damage for the entire game, for the most part anyway. Everything else here is just a list of hand-me-down TMs that pretty much all Pokemon get. It's not special. And if you're someone out there that wants me to talk about Horn Drill or if you're wondering if I'm going to learn it, we'll get to that awful move later in the video. Now on the bright side is the stats. If I didn't tell you anything about this Pokemon, you didn't know the moves, you didn't know that it was fire type or anything like that, you would think that these are pretty great because they are. 100 in attack, great. 105 in speed, really good. 80 in special, I can work with that. So let's kind of toss the negative to the side and let's just get to the route. Like I said earlier, Stomp and Amber they form a really solid core and today I'm gonna to take out all three bug catchers in Viridian Forest We have Ember pretty fast battles And then I'm gonna make my way over to the light years junior trainer to actually beat it not do any blackouts today And that's gonna take us to a nice solid level 10 and that's gonna already take us to the very first gym battle The two things to know here were fast, and despite Ember being resisted, it's a special move and Brock's Pokemon have low special so it does some pretty good damage. On the Geodude you would just love to see all defense curls, that would be ideal, but here we get pretty unlucky, we see a lot of tackles. And I'm going to say that this is a pretty bad first part of the fight overall, I get down all the way to 16 HP before we even get to the Onyx. Now the positives here, I still outspeed, and even though we don't have a lot of health, this is still easily winnable. You just use Ember, chip it down, when it uses Bide you go to growl and that's gonna lower its already low damage and you can see that even though it looks like we're in a bad spot I can still outlast the rock snake and we can get that first badge this is gonna give Rapidash a Brock split of 10 minutes and 56 seconds, which is pretty solid. Now to give you an idea, this is better than some pretty high tier Pokemon like Zapdos, for example. That's currently the fourth best Pokemon on the tier list. And I'm not gonna show split data just yet, but just know that I did decide to put Rapidash up against a split pace of 85 out of 100, but we'll hold off on that for now. We'll continue to talk about it. Let's just move on with the run. On the next route, there are a lot of bugs, easy knockouts, Ember does a lot of work here, and there's a nice little solid route that will get you to level 18 um, when you make it to Cerulean with the medium fast Pokemon and I've been enjoying doing that a lot lately. I did trim a little bit of that out and we'll go over that soon 
but you do take on the optional bug catcher here in addition to the move forward last usually you'll do one or the other but i take on both here and inside of mount moon we take on fan favorite super nerd we move on up to take on the double grass last and i finish up optional battles here with the mount moon hiker since we have ember and it's a pretty good matchup when i finish up the nerd fossil at the end i don't quite hit level 18 i'm 40 experience off and i knew i would be the solution here was to battle one or two wild battles around the viridian forest area you'd put a nice little bow on level 18 here but just in the interest of just getting the fastest run and just trimming off every little bit that i can i did cut it out so we're a little bit short here we'll go over why in just a second now misty's off the table and while level 18 and that extra damage rounding threshold does feel nice it just doesn't really do much for rapidash what I settled on today was just kind of daring the computer to roll the dice and use sand attack if it wants to, who cares? Now even if you were at level 18, this is why I cut out some stuff, you only have like a 35% chance to two shot and it's not like it even matters because it just goes for sand attack immediately because of course it does. And let me just say how good it feels when you just kind of ignore this move. The rival using sand attack is kind of like that little kid trying to be intentionally annoying so being able to just not acknowledge it, hit your moves anyway and not give them the attention that they're missing in their sad little lives, it feels me with joy this one does go pretty good but at the very end i do start to miss a couple of moves here and there i start to take a lot of damage but it is a successful first attempt the rivals down it's on to better things now next up is nugget bridge and if you didn't know this is the single highest cluster of mandatory battles in the entire game but rapidash it handles this part pretty well there's not much you can really do i get through it efficiently there's no need to really go into detail about it but let's skip ahead to that dig rocket grunt now this is a notorious trainer that can waste a lot of time even on the best of runs drowsy has hypnosis but that's not the focal point here now i talk often about that little pokey devil on my shoulder here that tells me to mix things up despite establishing a route doing multiple runs and to this point my route here was to skip misty backtrack later it was a little bit slower but it was more consistent and i just make the decision here on the fly just to try misty after this trainer for a couple of reasons that we'll get into but let's just dive into it the first reason I held off was because I wasn't level 23 and I didn't want to grind anymore. I wanted to trim down this route a lot. Now the Dig Grunt, the Golding Trainer, and Star U, it will push me to exactly level 23 and that helps a ton with damage and you're going to see me get a pretty solid fight here. I do see Bubble Beam and it does hurt a lot but I outspeed. I get a flinch at the end and I take the badge much earlier than I thought I would. Now what this does, it allows me to go the standard path and not have to skip Surge. Now when you skip Misty, that means later in the game you're gonna have to go Rock Tunnel, rush the Celadon Mart, go to Saffron a lot earlier than you'd want to, and then take Surge on so you can finally get Fly to kind of catch up in the run. I think it's a huge waste of time, so not having to do that is it's really big. Now I'll be the first person to admit, I don't always see the best route given the restraints I put on most runs. I usually I'll do three runs but for once this kind of like impromptu routing did kind of pay off and I was really excited for making this run just that much better on the SSN I do pick up body slam but I'm also gonna go get rest now this is the tried and true method to get past Gyarados in an efficient way without relying on something like a hydro pump miss or something absurd like a horn drill strategy so this is very important remember Lance and his Gyarados is the main antagonist of the entire video and when you optimize these sorts of runs all roads lead to that point i do get the gentleman candy and as far as travel number three it goes like you would expect it's not going to be a one shot at the start but there's no sand and i just body slam into the end and it's a pretty clean victory on to Surge, and it's gonna be more of the same. Now let me just say how huge, once again, let me emphasize this, how big it was for the run to be able to do this now, but let me kind of shine a light on why I'm, I'm kind of down on Rapidash, at least at the start of this process. Now despite having a solid attack stat, you just never really get one shots for the most part. Essentially everything in this entire run is gonna play out similar to this battle, where the main threats can survive a hit or two, and I think that's a good way to sum up how I feel about this run overall, but let's move on. Rock Tunnel is going to be easy for the most part but we do have to focus on one battle and you guys already know what that is this is going to be the first battle of the game we're not learning something like dig or maybe something helpful is going to hold you back at the end of the day it's a minor speed bump doesn't really matter much but this is where playing a bunch of different runs over the course of you know the years helps 
In the Firo versus Dodrio video, we use the Growl strategy here, and I'm going to use it today. I think in a perfect world, Straight Ember would be faster, but Growl is safer overall. I get really good rolls here, like godlike rolls here. First turn Growl, self-destruct. Second Geodude comes in, Growl, self-destruct. And I think this just kind of demonstrates just how good the Growl only strat is in this fight. I think it's highly underrated. It's pretty good. Try it out. So real quick, I forgot to mention this. I told myself I'd start doing this early in the video, but I would like to tell you guys what sprites and all that kind of stuff I'm using for the video. You guys know I like to change it up, but for this one, I'm using Pokemon Green front sprites. I'm using the 1997 Space World demo back sprites, and then we're using the Pokemon Yellow palette. But now that this part's out of the way, we can just kind of go back to Celadon. At this point, we do have a choice. We can go to the hideout or we can go to Erica's gym. And both of them aren't perfect matchups. I want to train just a little bit in the gym, but let me tell you guys, you have to be careful here. I mix up the order here to kind of avoid para wrap, but let's kind of just look at the gym battle. The reason this fight is scary is good AI. Who would have thought? Now Rapidash, it has very low base HP, and when you start looking at things like poison combined with rap, it's gonna slowly just chip away at our health and it can add up extremely fast. Now the path to victory here is pretty straightforward, but like I tend to do, I just like to call attention that Erica is a monstrously good gym leader. One of the best in the game. I would rank her number two overall in Pokemon Red. Now even on a battle like this where I have a supreme top matchup, and I would say that this battle didn't even go back it went pretty good I still almost get to the red health and remember this was the good option so that's another badge down that's gonna take us straight into the hideout and there's a few things to kind of unpack here the first is that I'll be getting all of the PP ups I'll be getting three for fire blast later as well as all the high money items for our mark buy and just like nine tails and some other runs I'm gonna be grabbing double edge it's gonna be very important when you combine that with rest it's gonna form that perfect concoction that's gonna get me through the game smooth and we also have Giovanni coming up which it can be hard for a lot of runs and let's see if Rapidash is an exception there without dig growl is all right here you have to be a little bit diligent because guard specs are in play usually you don't even worry about them but it does stop you from lowering the opponent's stats so my strat overall here is to start out with a growl use ember and it works pretty well giovanni does try to weasel his way out of this with a crit but rapidash responds with a crit of its own and that's going to be another win it wasn't too comfortable and i want you guys to pay attention to that because it's kind of a theme of rapidash it's never too comfortable Next up is the Celadon buy, and it's pretty light here. I don't get any of the extra TMs to sell for money. I grab a Poke Doll for Mimic, Fresh Water, we get all the usual stuff. And I'm able to pick up five Calciums here. Now this is a kind of a weird buy. Normally I would just skip all the stuff in general just to save some time, but that extra bit of special helps on fights like Agatha, and it helps you be a little bit more tanky against other stuff that can pose a threat. Not really much more to say about it. Pretty quick overall. That's going to take us to Pokemon Tower, and I'm going to skip over rival number four today. We don't need to look at it, but instead I would like to talk about the channelers. I just name dropped Agatha real quick, so let's talk about Ghost a little bit here and now. Once again, this is like the second little location where not having something like Dig kind of hurts you a little bit. All we have is Ember for the Gastlys, and it's going to be a two shot. And when it's a two shot, you kind of open yourself up to some bad luck. Like what if you get confused, Ray, hurt yourself a few times. You never know what's going to happen, and you, you guys know that with Agatha that's kind of amplified so I really want to call attention that we don't really have much for Ghost it could be a problem later I guess we'll just have to see but that's kind of Pokemon Tower in a nutshell not too bad but we don't have a great answer and just like everything else it takes multiple hits to take something down that's the theme of the video I've already said it multiple times now we're going to be heading down to Fuchsia, and just once again, every once in a while I'll talk about this, but this is the kind of route where you want to rush Blaine as fast as possible. This means you have to catch some sort of other Surf user, so Snorlax I think is the best option. You can do it however you want, you can legitimately catch this thing, but I just have my guaranteed catch rate on Pokeballs. Say what you will about it, I really don't care. But this part's really important, because believe it or not, Rapidash doesn't have to grind a ton, but right now is the part of the game where it's absolutely pivotal to get a few extra levels to help you out in the run and I think that cycling road bikers are the best choice 
especially when looking at all the other options just because they're so close and clustered together. Now overall, there's going to be seven total backers. I think there's actually eight total, but one of the backers has two Volt Orbs. And I think that's pretty trash experience, so I usually cut that out. But they usually have a combination of coughing, wheezing, grammar, or muck, and they just give good experience. Now in an ideal world, in a perfect scenario, you would have Dig. This is going to be the third part where Dig really hurts. And I guess we can sit here and we can talk about the philosophical merits of a horse being able to use Dig, but this is Pokemon. I think it should be able to Dig, but what do I know? But pretty much you just use Body Slam to hit the hardest here. Use Ember to finish off some low health stuff. And you do have to use an Elixir in this location. But you do have to be careful here. I didn't mention this earlier, but I did pick up about five extra Super Potions total just to make this part of the game a little bit better. Because without it, you would run out of healing and it gets really bad. And if you're having to go back to the Poke Center, you're starting to bleed a lot of time and the run just isn't efficient. But what you really need to know, just the TLDR if you just kind of zoned out for a second, seven backers, decent experience. We need all we can get right here. That's pretty much it. The Safari Zone after that is it is standard. I can skip the Carbos, but I do pick up the Protein. I pick up the final weight gems of the run. I'm going to teach Surf to Snorlax because we got it early. I do want to call attention to something that I haven't really mentioned in a video. We've been doing this new overlay here. Um, I used to have the bag number. I thought it was too big and gaudy, so I have like a more subtle approach. Up at the top next to my level, top left, is going to be a little bag. It's kind of green color. This means that I have 16 or more slots in my out of my 20 bag slots full and keep paying attention in the video I don't know if you'll see it on this but when I have 19 in my bag it turns yellow when I have 20 in my bag it turns red so this is kind of like a quick indicator this is pretty much just for me where I can see how full my bag is I don't think I've ever brought it up in a video but just in case you're wondering that's why I think I got like one comment about it there you go up next we're gonna do fuchsia and this is gonna be very very critical to getting fire blast we want to get to blaine as fast as possible and this is kind of the path that we have to take now these battles aren't going to be too bad leading up to koga and while they're just kind of playing out in the background here let me talk about reflect i think overall reflect is the safer play for the run like if you want to make sure battles are a lot easier you take a lot less damage and things are just more manageable overall you should probably get that move it essentially doubles your defense that's kind of like a simple explanation for it, but that's good enough. Pretty much halves the damage you take. And it would make several fights a lot easier. I'm not really trying to like foreshadow anything too hard here, but that is going to take us straight to Koga. Let's just take a look at how that goes. I brought up Reflect because Koga would be a fight where it probably would help. Now once again, we only have neutral damage, we're not going to be one-shotting things, and it can just get volatile real fast, and we're going to see that when the Muck does massive damage to me. This was a crit, and it's not something that even Reflect would really help, and that's ultimately going to be the reason why I decided to just kind of cut it out, save a little time. The idea here is to use Growl once again, and let me just say that I love that Growl has a lot of use even this late into the run, but I just get too low here, and this is where we're going to the very first reset of the run. On the next attempt, you can see this fight go how it usually goes in practice at least. We don't get crit, and to help out even further, I don't get poisoned. So at the end of the fight, I'm pretty healthy and I get a perfect outcome with a growl directly into a self destruct. And believe it or not, I think that this was probably the hardest fight of the run, but this is a big moment. Because now we're going to get access to Blaine, and that's going to be great. But first, we can finally pull up that split data, and I've kind of hidden it from you for a while. I wanted to try to weave the narrative a little bit and kind of shed a light on the flaws of Rapid Dash. Now remember, the pace today is for a solid 85 out of 100 rating. And if you don't know my ratings, they plug in the metrics here into a formula. That's how we get this number out of 100. There's an unlisted video if you want to know more about that. But for the first five gems, Rapidash is crushing it. It did slip a little bit on Cycling Road for all that training. But right now we are a massive 16 minutes ahead of schedule. Now whether or not Rapidash can keep this up with the Gyarados looming at the end of the game, it's up in the air. But for now, Rapidash is just outperforming expectations. And even with all my worries, my frustration, and the negatives that I've talked about, it's been a pretty great run. But guys, they don't really hand out rankings and tier cards for just completing half the game. So we still got a lot more to go. That will take us to a brisk swim down to Cinnabar. And it's probably already started in the background. But today, I need a little more training 
training and I'm going to do it right here. Now the first is this fisherman. He's got multiple sea kings, really good for experience. Now I'm not going to pretend that this is something that I discovered, but it's kind of the beauty of community, learning from watching other content creators. But when we finally get down to Pokemon Mansion, there's going to be several battles here. They're going to be five total and I'm doing them here now in the mansion so that I don't have to do the battles inside of Blaine's gym because that's going to make me have to heal, maybe waste some resources. And at worst, I would have to use like a PP restoring item and I didn't want to do that. This just felt more efficient and on top of all that, it's just less trainers overall. That's going to take us to another brain teasing question of if Team 28 is actually Tombstoner, brother, or not. And we can just take this straight into Blaine. Now this fight, it's not interesting, just to keep it blunt, keep it real with you guys. I just use Body Slam. Some things of note is that Growl for the enemy Rapidash, it can be really annoying and slow things down a lot. And you could use Reflect to make this fight more comfortable as well, but it wasn't really a tough battle in the first place. Now I utilize Growl on the Arcanine just for safety, and that's just because the run has been so good up to this point, but it really doesn't matter. The real prize here is going to be getting Fire Blast, and the special boost from Blaine's badge, it's not going to be that bad either. That's going to take us straight to Silphco, and we need to kind of just blitz through the rest of the game to keep up the pace. Now, I will go to the 10th floor. We're going to get the rare candy like usual, and there's going to be very few extra battles from here until the end of the game, and that's ultimately just going to quickly take us to rival number five. And since we kind of routed weird and we held off on that, we don't really even need a true intro today. Fire Blast just puts our power to a whole nother level. And you're going to see it play out when we finally hit a one shot on the Pidgeot. From there, you kind of just swap to whatever move is relevant between Body Slam and Fire Blast. And the extra levels ensure that this one isn't bad at all. The Blastoise at the end is really tanky, but remember that he doesn't have anything threatening like a Hydro Pump yet. But this one is pretty clean. It's about all there is to say. I do pick up Mimic and I do learn it, but let's dive straight into Sabrina. I have the damage along with Fire Blast, and that makes this pretty trivial. Now the only thing to touch on is that Alakazam can survive a hit. Let's say maybe you miss a Fire Blast earlier, maybe you take some damage. You could see a reset here because it could do like a, it could crit you to some heavy damage back to you, but it works out great here. We don't have to worry about that. That's just hypothetical. That's the seventh badge down. Now going into the last gym, there are two optional battles off to the side here. This is to specifically set up my experience for later. And remember, this is all going to be ultimately to put me where I want to be going into Lance. So two battles here, straight to the gym. Like most Giovanni fights, we're going to use Mimic here to get Dig on the Doug Trio. Now the thing to look out here is that maybe if you Mimic Dig and then Doug Trio goes for Dig like it does here. The simple solution here is to use your own Dig. That's going to cause the Doug Trio to miss. And then you'll just hit these three little sausages and just knock them out. From there, it's a simple matter of using Dig. And there's really not much danger overall outside of the Doug Trio hitting you with a Dig. And that's just going to be the final badge. There's not much more to say about it. After the battle, this is where I'm going to use some candies because rival number six is not the best matchup at our current level. I'm going to go heal. I'm going to use five total rare candies to get to a nice level 55, and that's going to get us agility. Now, it's not really important to the grand scheme overall to the run, but in a pinch and a tough battle, it can give you that little extra boost. And I will just say right now that I think agility is by far the worst badge boosting move. I think I said that at the start of the video. I think agility is bad, okay? Maybe that's a hot take, but let's get on with rival six. With the candy optimization, this one's pretty straightforward. Fire Blast can just erase the Pidgeot, and then the same thing goes for the Rhyhorn. From there, I do want to set up just a little bit on Growlithe just to give my damage that little extra punch. And when I hit that point, I can start just plowing through the next few Pokemon. Execute, Dalakazam, they'll go down easily enough in one shot. But the reason for the levels was Blastoise. Hydro Pump is just a huge threat, and hitting a high percentage two-shot range made this one feel about as smooth as it could be. You can see that even at level five, Body Slam just can't quite hit that two-shot range. I don't get it. Hydro Pump does a massive amount of damage, but at the end of the day, this one came down to me just getting a little unlucky with that two-shot range, but then I got that luck right back with a withdrawal, and that ensures that I knock it out. No resets will be had today, and that's just going to leave us with the Elite Four. Now looking ahead, we kind of know the looming threats. Agatha is a little bit iffy. 
kind of a coin toss like it usually is. And Gyarados is the raid boss we've been kind of preparing for. So there is a little bit of work left to do, but first let's talk about split data for the last time in the video. Remember that the Elite Four start is when I walk into Lorelei's room, and Pokemon use slightly different routings, so the first few splits and the final splits are the important things to look at. But Rapidash, it's kept it strong, and it's still having a pretty solid run. Remember that the pace today is 85 out of 100, which is roughly around 2 hours and 49 minutes if you have low resets. And we're about seven and a half minutes of that, so let's go ahead and see what we have to do in Victory Road. I am going to grab the rare candy here, and I need a singular battle from the very first cool trainer here to push my experience right where it needs to be. And that's basically all the setup that Rapidash needs. Hey, this is post-editing, Matt. I'm here to insert a part into a video. I, I forgot I got to the end of recording everything, and I completely forgot to talk about Horn Drill at all, so we'll just do it right here. I'll give you the quick rundown, the TLDR. If you look at, like, Rapidash or Ponytop videos across the internet, a lot of people use this move. They think it's pretty good. I adamantly disagree. I think this move is dog water. I think it's really bad, and I think at no point in the run would it ever save you any time. Now, it's a 30% accurate one-hit KO move. It's usually going to miss. It has, you know, five power points. If you look at the probability and statistics and you do the math, you approach about 83% probability of hitting a horn jewel if you use it five times in a row. And, I, you know, it is what it is. Like, it could be okay, but at what point would it really help is what I'm trying to say. I don't think it's any good, and I just really wanted to really quickly at least bring it up and kind of talk about it. Now, if you want to discuss the merits of it down below, you can let me know. But keep in mind that I do have an open mind and I'll listen to anybody talk about any sort of strategy but if you're telling me that horn drill was good in your seven hour run of Rapidash it's kind of irrelevant like I could just use tackle if I took 12 hours to beat the game that's beside the point I don't want to get negative I think horn drill's bad and I just wanted to bring it up so let's cut back to what I actually recorded and let's kind of finish out this video now we've kind of covered everything that we need to I think we're all prepared we're level 56 let's just dive in and see how the elite four plays out Dugong is first, and the play here, like always, is to chip it down and hope that it uses rest. It happens here, and you could get by here with as little as one agility, but I go for the full complement of setups, and after missing a fire blast, having it survive the next one, I move on, but I do take roughly half of my health going into the second Pokemon. Now here you need at least one agility to ensure the range on Cloyster with fire blast, because Clamp does nasty damage and you just can't afford to have one connect, so I think this is the best way just to get the one shot and move on with your life. Slowbro is next, and fun fact, Slowbro has like a 1% chance to crit, but like in all my practice runs, it crit me so many times it was kind of absurd. Now water guns, even if they don't crit, they can start to add up, but the play here like usual is to take Amnesia and use it as many times as you're really comfortable with. Two times at least would be good, but I just set up all the way here. At that point, you take out Slowbro, and what it really comes down to is if Fire Blast miss. Now I didn't take a Grout earlier in the fight, so I can just Body Slam the Jinx, and with the special boost, you might be able to survive something like a Hydro Pump from Lapras, but we don't have to find out. And this one did get a little messy early, but a first try victory, always nice in my book. Bruno is up next, and let's not make this go any longer than it really has to. Just use Fire Blast. It's not really a one shot everywhere, we're kind of used to that from this video so far, but I think this is the fastest route, and that's about all the in-depth analysis that you're going to get for Bruno. After the fight, I do hit level 58, and in this moment, this is where I decide to pull the trigger and use my seven remaining rare candies. This is going to let me hit level 65, and that's going to be the magic level to hopefully solve all of our remaining problems, and I think we can just get down to business. Here are the facts for Agatha. Fire Blast cannot one-shot, big surprise. And this is kind of like a microcosm for the run. We've talked about this a lot so far. And like we see all the time on this fight, it's gonna come down to what the first Gengar wants to do. And I get put to sleep really early. And usually that's really bad, but sometimes Agatha just doesn't really do anything. She lets me linger around. I'm able to wake up, move on. And just like the wise words of Danny DeVito, I just start blasting. Now it is important to use Body Slam on the non-ghost since you only have eight total Fire Blast but I kind of bob and weave my way through the fight the best that I can. I use an agility to kind of offset a haze from the goal bat earlier. And at the end of the fight, I do get rewarded with a crit to just end the fight and take out a pretty tough challenge.
Now is going to be the time for a moveset pivot. Body Slam and Fire Blast are a must. I have to have them. So the best results, I'm kind of forced to give up Mimic and Agility here for Double Edge and Rest. I know that not everyone is on that Double Edge train, but allow me to kind of demonstrate and talk you through how it makes a battle that, you know, normally you would need to rely on some heavy luck or be several levels higher for it to be consistent. But we're about to put on a master class of how to do this fight correctly. Finally, we've arrived at the raid boss, and the idea here is that level 65 does two things. It gives me the HP range that I want, and the second thing, the most important thing, is a near guaranteed two-shot range from Double Edge. Now let's pause the footage and let's dive a little bit deeper real quick. Recoil-inducing moves like Double Edge, they deal 25% of the damage dealt back to you. So you might be asking yourself, how do you know if this fight is consistent, or better yet, how do I come to the conclusion when I'm routing this run out? Now from software, we know Gyarados is max HP, you can see it on the screen. And however you want to get it, you can find the damage ranges for Hydro Pump. Now I know that a non-crit max roll for Hydro Pump is going to be 138 damage. Now given that we have 197 HP, that max roll damage would leave us with 59 HP. Gyarados has a total of 187 HP, so that means that Double Edge dealing 25% of that back to us would deal 46 damage. And it's going to be exactly 46 because there's a math floor in all these games. Not worth going into it too much now everything rounds down pretty much no fractions so that means if hydro pump doesn't crit we will survive this part of the fight at 13 health in the worst case scenario at the absolute worst we're at 13 hp which is cutting it close it might look like that but tight optimizations it it's what makes the run so fun for me to do now let's unpause and we can see here that it's just going to miss the hydro pump and i just kind of get through so just like a run like charizard where i got a little luck i'll take it but we did have rest and trust me when i say that this was a hundred percent consistent if Gyarados didn't crit that's important so that's going to take us into the rest of the fight I'm just going to let it play out here and you'll see what I'm talking about here I'm going to say that with these optimizations Gyarados actually wasn't the hardest part of this fight without agility I can't boost my damage and it comes a little bit of a challenge to get through everything you still have to use rest here and there and this is why body slam was so crucial to keep now this fight is already tight and if you are consistently doing damage back to yourself it becomes significantly harder so what you're going to see me play out is I'm going to do a little bit of damage, I'm going to rest when I'm low, I'm going to rinse and repeat that process over and over, and this is going to get close several times, and ultimately at the end of the fight, I'm going to be in red health, but a first try lance for a fire type, it's always great, we don't need the additional commentary, I feel like we got the full rundown of lance, and that's going to take us to the last battle of the run. Pidgeot is the lead and with no badge boosting moves, it's just, it's really straightforward. I take a little damage here and there, I can't one shot it, but this one, not too bad. Alakazam gets a body slam and it survives and it might look like double edge would be the way to go, but it's not a guaranteed one shot and I was worried that maybe it would survive and then crit me back and knock me out. So I played a little safe here, but I'm still pretty healthy going into the ride on. So here we're going to need to do a familiar strategy. I need to stall just a little bit and I need at least three badge boosts from a leer or a tail whip from ride on. Either, uh, either of those will do. Remember that we have rest, so any damage that we picked up early in the fight or right here can be healed up. And this makes the stall tactic really safe to do. Now out of all the stalling and how long this little part of the battle takes, I can only manage to get two boost, so it's going to have to do. On the thick puppy, I thankfully I get the two shot range here and it doesn't go for takedown. And when we make it to executor, my fire blast connects to obliterate it, which always feels good. And at the very end of the fight is the tanky turtle. Three boosts make this part feel pretty good, but with two, it looks like we can barely even hit the three shot range. I do swap over to double edge, but then I get hit with a hydro pump and it does massive damage. But thankfully at this point in the fight, it's in a health range where a fire blast can connect and just in the run in style. Rapidash finishes the run with a 2 hour, 45 minute, and 39 second time, and it only has a single reset, and with those numbers, those metrics, it's going to earn itself an 86.2 out of 100 for its little tier card here, and this Pokemon beat the pace that I set for it, which is pretty cool. I usually go a little bit higher for the pace, but, but I like to see something succeed where I didn't think it would. Now, I think it's worth noting that if I didn't make that last second change to do Misty first, I do think it would be a couple of points lower, but I'm really proud of this run. During my blind run I just thought this Pokemon was mid and it felt kind of bad to play because you never one-shot stuff 
And it made things feel really clunky and kind of slow, but it turns out that having over 100 in attack and speed, it can really carry you even if you have no coverage. Now the tier list should have already been rolling out, and I'm pretty sure at this moment we have all the way up to the Zapdos stream on here with this really impressive fourth place finish on that redo stream. Go check that out if you haven't. Now I had a lot of fun with this one. I say that a lot, and I think originally going into this one, if I had to just blindly put a pace on this one, I would say this Pokemon would be C tier at best, but this is why you play the runs. This is why this is such a fun hobby for me. Special shout out to my channel members and Patreons. The support means a lot, and if you made it this far into the video, you're a real one, and I really do appreciate that the most. I didn't want to show the split data at the end because I think it's kind of redundant just to keep showing it. We just showed it before the Elite four and I say the final time after the run so what's the point you can give me some feedback but I think that's a good way to think about it I think it's a good call not to show it now finally when I'm done with this one I think I can start putting those finishing touches on the crystal overlay and start pumping out at least one two three crystal videos because I was having a great time playing crystal before I had to go and overhaul the entire overlay and everything so I'm excited about that but that's enough babbling I hope you enjoyed the video have a great week and I'll catch you guys in the next one bye